and we are live i think let me quickly check <laughs> that's what it says <laughs> Perfect. So this is all set. Perfect. I think uh, it's 7.30, we should start. I know folks will keep joining in, but let's get to our agenda. So welcome everyone. This is Connections main event, our first day. Uh, and this event is brought to you by IISOC and INTC. Uh, we have a great set of speakers, a, a panelist, a lot of in interesting technology tra tracks throughout the week. And I hope you'll continue to participate throughout the week. We are looking forward to a great Connections 22 this time. So let me give a very quick introduction to IISOC. I am Dhruv. I'm the president of uh, IISOC. And then I will ask Kathy to introduce uh, about INTC. Uh, IISOC is a nonprofit. We are based in India. We started back in 2017 with the aim of bringing various different stakeholders uh, from Indian community academia, service providers, all the software developers working for different vendors uh, in India, and even government and service provider folks. People who consume internet standards, consume ITF products, but do not usually participate as much in the standard making. And we wanted to like, you know, bring the gap between the two uh, a little closer. And with this e uh, mission, we were doing very different activities. Connections is our annual event. And apart from that, we also organize uh, RFCs we love, uh, sort of a meetup, uh, which is kind of fun, uh, talking about various different technologies. We do, when we used to meet in person in I ITF, we used to do an Indian get together, get people connected. So with that aim, we have been doing various different activities. We have been supported with our mission uh, for IPv6 uh, webinars uh, back in 2020 and 2021 from ISAF Asia. And we are very grateful for that. And we have been partnering with uh, INTC uh, and even universities in India like NITK and NFSU, which is uh, a university under Ministry of Home Affairs. It's for forensic science. Uh, and we are grateful for these partnerships as well. For more details, please check out our website. And now I will ask uh, Kathy to introduce about INTC. Hi, um, I'm Kathy Aronson. I'm the uh, chairman of the board of Industry Network Technology Council. And like Drew said, we're, we've been working with IIESOC and um, enterprises. Basically, our, our, our function is to try to get more involvement with um, standards, internet standards bodies and underrepresented audiences like enterprises, academia and government so that their voices are at the table when standards that affect them are being written. We also uh, have uh, everything we do is free to everyone. So you can attend our webinars. Um, and we've received a number of grants from Aaron, which we're very, very grateful for a lot of support from Aaron. Um, if you want to check us out, we're industry network, industrynetcouncil.org. And we are also a nonprofit. Um, next slide, maybe. Drew? Yeah. Ah, there we go. So yeah, so Connections, this is our uh, five-day event, we introduced it. We have um, a number of really great talks today. I'm glad you're all here to hear them. We're super excited about it. Um, and Drew covered, um, our, pa our past events are also online. So check us out. Next slide. I don't know if I have a, oh yeah. And then um, stay in touch with us. These are all our links to get in touch with us. And if you're not already a member of INTC, please join. And if you are a member, please vote because there's an election going on right now. And we'd love to have as many members as possible uh, vote in the election. That would be awesome. And you can follow us on our social media and stuff too. Thanks.
Uh, thanks, Kathy. Uh, let me go over a quick agenda for the five days. This is our day one event. Uh, we have three speakers uh, and a very special message. Uh, so the three speakers today would be covering a lot of interesting topics. We have topics on IPv6. We have uh, Paul talking about uh, like, you know, the issues with uh, security and privacy loss and how it's going to impact the private managed networks. And we have Ron Bonica talking about things that keep him awake at night, the problems uh, of, of the internet. Uh, Tuesday, it's all about IPv6 extension headers, uh, a great set of talks, and then a panel discussion uh, moderated by Eric Wank. And we have uh, diff various different uh, stakeholders uh, represented on this panel. So I'm really looking forward for this discussion. The day three, which is our Wednesday, this is hot in networking track. We have things which are la like latest being developed in ITF and IRTF, things which are being discussed in ITF side meetings uh, vigorously. So this is also gonna be bringing you the latest stuff that's happening uh, in the uh, ITF and IRTF space. Uh, the day four is IoT. Uh, we will be talking about the whole standard landscape. Uh, we are kicking off an IoT webinar series at the end of April. So we will talk about that, that what will this series be all about, the next set of webinars that are being organized by INTC and IISOC. And again, we have a very interesting panel discussion uh, again, bringing folks from academia, folks from Indian startups uh, in the IoT space, and again, uh, people uh, like you know from vendors as well. So th uh, this is our day four, and the final day, thinking beyond ITF. What other SDOs uh, like you know for an enterprise network needs to be aware of SDOs, SIGs, and thinks about uh, BBF, for instance, testing Wi-Fi performance device management, and even uh, private 5G networks from Satish from Reliance Geo. So again, a great set of uh, uh, talks, thinking beyond just IP and ITF work. So that covers our, uh, the whole agenda for the day. And I hope, uh, like, you know, thanks for our speakers. Thanks for everybody coming in. We hope you enjoy uh, this program. Off to you, Kathy. I'd really like to thank our sponsors. We're super excited to have you all on board. Um, thanks, it's just awesome to have the support. Next slide, I don't know what, yeah. And thanks to everybody who's here to participate and give talks, it takes your time out of your day and we really appreciate all of it, thanks. And we, <laughs> we hope you have a good time. <laughs> Okay, so we have a special message from, um, from Vint Surf to start us off today. Hello, my name is Vint Surf. I've had a very long involvement in the evolution of the internet, going all the way back to its predecessor, the ARPANET in 1969. Kathy Aronson asked me what keeps you awake at night and I would guess uh, three things in particular, three, three alligators uh, among many others. One of them is resilience of the internet itself because we're so dependent on this every single day with our mobiles, our laptops, our pads, and all the applications that are in the cloud. Uh, we just rely on the existence and uh, functioning of this global infrastructure. Safety and security are two other alligators that we have to wrestle with. I'm deeply concerned because of our dependence uh, on the internet that it be a safe place and a secure place in which to operate. And we have a long way to go to make that true too. Uh, the vulnerability of a lot of the software in the internet, not so much the underlying network, but many of the applications on top of it and the devices that, that use it like mobiles and Internet of Things, you know, appliances and things like that, plus all the conventional computing and laptops and desktops and so on. So all of those things are full of software. And unfortunately, most software has bugs in it and smart people find ways of exploiting that for their own benefit and not to your best interest. So uh, safety and security are additional alligators to be wrestled. Uh, the other uh, another one that I worry about and it keeps me up is that not everyone who could use access to the internet has affordable and reliable access to it. And that 
too needs to be addressed. It's estimated that maybe 60% of the world's population actually has access to the internet, but the other 40% either can't afford it or it just isn't available at all, or it's not available in quantity that allows useful application. So yet another alligator to wrestle. There are many more, but I only got two or three minutes to talk about this. I hope some of you will join me in wrestling these alligator, alligators to the ground, uh, because if we are successful, of course, internet will become even more useful than it is today. Meanwhile, see you on the net. Hello, my name is Ben. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so um, everybody, um, please ask questions if you have them. Um, there's some info here about, um, you can put them in the chat. You can raise your hand. Um, yeah. Um, oh, do we, we have a, a question? I don't, I don't know about this person with the best question of the day thing, Drew. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Uh, just so that we can like, you know, get you guys a little more incentive to ask questions. We thought, uh, why not, like, you know, the best question of the day, and we would, like, uh, make a donation to their recommended charity or cause, a small amount, but, like, you know, just fight for the cause and ask the best question today, and hope you have a really good time today. Right, so next up, our, so as you can tell from Vince's talk, we we asked a number of people for this conference, what keeps you up at night with respect to the internet to try to generate <clears throat> you know, some new interesting um, thoughts about that. And so Paul Wilson, who's the director general of APNIC, the Asia Pacific Network Information Center graciously offered to give us a little chat about what keeps him up at night. And so here we go, here's Paul, thanks so much. Hi. Thank you, Kathy. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks, um, thanks to you too, Drew, for for having me. Um, great to great to be here. I uh, hope you can hear me well. Um, I'm Paul. I'm the head of APNIC and APNIC's the Regional Internet Address Registry, the RIR for the Asia Pacific region. And I guess we all know what uh, what basically what an RIR does. Um, as Kathy said, and like, like others who are speaking today, I was asked to talk about uh, what keeps me awake at night um, about the internet. And probably like Vint and others, I could say lots of things about this and could talk on and on. Um, there, really is, there really is so much to say. Um, but I thought I'd, I'd, I'd start with a couple, start with one thing and lead on to, to a, a few others and see how, see how we go. But the, the first topic is one that is going to be covered a lot in uh, in this uh, meeting, and that's something that's very traditional as a worry for the RIRs, and that's IPv6. Now, as an RIR, the the R, an RIR like APNIC isn't actually responsible for internet operations and deployment, but our members are the ones who are building the internet around the world, and and IPv6 is def definitely a challenge for them. It's for them to tackle the, the deployment of, of IPv6 through the internet infrastructure. So in case of APNIC, but also other RIRs, we have always given the members, our members, as much support as we can uh, in their technical activities, building the internet, training, infrastructure support, the conferences and things that we run. And we've been asked by our members uh, consistently over the years to help with IPv6. And so, in fact, we've been promoting IPv6 for nearly, I, su I suppose, 25 years. Um, and I think we did lose a lot of sleep over v6 because until 2010 or 2012, about 10 years ago, there was around zero uh, deployment. There was around no deployment of IPv6 on the internet at all. And people back then, 10 years ago, were saying that IPv6 was a train wreck, <laughs> to quote one, uh, one commentator, uh, that there was uh, too much working against IPv6 and it was, uh, it was bound for failure. But uh, I think that was one viewpoint and many of us continued to work on IPv6 quite hard over that time. And it's, it's great that uh, today we're at about a 35% adoption 
rate for IPv6 across the internet globally. So that's a, that's a um, very significant deployment. The ongoing growth is still steady, slow but steady at about three or 4% a year by at, least, by at least one measure. Now predicting that the future of that is hard, um, but uh, by the growth rates that have been happening over the last few years, we're, we're looking at um, something like 65% by 2030 on a linear projection and even 100% by 2040, which is um, a very difficult uh, number to predict, very uncertain because that growth could, could climb or fall for all sorts of different reasons over the next 10 to 20 years, of course. Now, I'm sure Bob Hinden will have a lot more to say about this shortly and you'll hear more um, tomorrow, but from APNIC's point of view, um, we're gonna keep supporting IPv6. It's going pretty steadily. And I, I don't think anyone's uh, losing sleep over IPv6 anymore, which is a pretty nice thing. And it's a big change from, from 10 years ago. So as long as we keep it up, uh, IPv6 deployment seems to be on track. But I think the reason I raise IPv6 um, is something that it shows in the slow de deployment, the slow pace of deployment of, of v6 actually tells us a lot, I think. The fact that, that v6 hasn't been essential so far for at least 65% of the net. I mean, we, we all heard and, and many of us have said for many years that the only way to keep growing the internet is with IPv6. And yet it seems to be growing uh, anyway, pretty rapidly. Um, the thing is the fine print of that warning was that in order to grow the global end-to-end -end internet, we need IPv6 and we, we need IPv6 absolutely because those endpoints need public addresses and they just simply aren't enough. So we can't, we can't have that global end-to-end -end internet uh, without V6. And the fact that the internet uh, keeps growing uh, kind of means that the internet that we have been growing is no longer that um, global end-to-end -end internet. It's actually something quite different. And that's uh, something actually that, that keeps me awake. And I think it should keep all of us awake if we're really um, dedicated to, in some way, the, the original model of the internet is that, that global end-to-end -end network um, with its intelligence at the edges, et cetera, which is something I'll touch on. Um, but the internet um, of today, the one that we've been growing actually is, dif is different in a lot of ways. It's different because of NAT, network address translation for one thing. But I, I don't think NAT is such so much the culprit that worries me. I mean, it, NAT adds extra address space uh, to the internet uh, by way of that extra port address um, sort of get that, that effectively gets tagged on in a, in a clunky, kludgy manner. And it does require additional clunky clutches to achieve end-to-end -end connectivity, but it actually has worked. It's, and that has done what we've asked it to do and most people don't, um, don't notice it. But the thing is that basically what we've asked to do, asked NAT to do um, over all these years, which has worked well enough, but it's limited. It's, it, we've asked NAT to help us to connect mostly browsers to the internet uh, in the form of Chrome and Firefox and even, even Android and iPhone applications are effectively web-based uh, packaged uh, browser applications and they all work uh, together in the same way as simply as browsers or in old terms, uh, terminals onto an internet that's actually kind of created elsewhere. The, the internet that you're accessing via that browser terminal window is not local, it's somewhere else. And that's a thing because we used to say that what's, what makes the internet unique is um, not just the global end-to-end -end thing, but it's also that the intelligence of the internet is at the edges. And I, I think it's pretty clear that that's, that's no longer true. We've got a lot of power at the edges. You know, browsers are not, um, these days, they're pretty high-powered um, computer programs on pretty high-powered um, architectures, but I think that that power is not really being used so much for, for intelligence, uh, for the sort of general purpose computing that we thought about in terms of intelligence at the edges, because that power is kind of being consumed by the browser doing things like rendering video to the, to the highest uh, resolution. <laughs> 
not uh, not trivial, but also not very intelligent. Um, browsers run software that um, that they download, but that's not exactly autonomous intelligent computing. Browsers run code; they execute code on demand as a as a client of a service that's operating elsewhere. It's a form of um, of intelligence for sure, but it's um, and pardon the expression, it's it's the intelligence that's ex expected of a slave. Um, it's not what we imagined, I think, uh, when we said that the intelligence of the internet is at the at the edges. And, and actually, I think the other intelligence we've lost, frankly, and this is something to lose sleep over, is the um, is is in the brain of the users themselves, right? Because um, to be honest, um, net network users are uh, no longer as autonomous and uh, and maybe intelligent as we as we originally had to be, we've kind of reverted actually to the, the those bad old days of, of television when it was said, and it was said back in the 1970s that TV viewers are not actually consumers at all, they're a product. TV viewers are a product that is that uh, are sold to advertisers. And that sounds really familiar, I think, I hope to everyone here, because it's exactly what we hear about Google, Facebook, Instagram, and and all the rest, um, we hear exactly the same thing that we're not we're no longer consumers; we're a product. So, how um, has all this happened to the internet? I think it's I think it's quite relevant to this meeting because it's got a lot to do with standards, and the fact that there are a bunch of standards that we rely on that have successfully built this um, open. Uh, accessible, uniform transport layer of the internet. It's been successful even without IPv6. Um, IPv6 is coming along as part of the standards process. Um, but the standards at that level have been, have been highly successful, but open standards at the higher level have pretty much disappeared or, or not, let's say they haven't advanced it in the same way as standards below them. Um, and I'm talking about the higher levels of the of the network services and the applications that that today um, technically you might not refer to them as part of the internet, the internet layer. But when we talk to, talk about the internet uh, collectively and the internet as a whole and the internet as it affects society, we're talking about a whole bunch of network services, applications, and things which have completely fallen away from any kind of standards um, standardized approach. I actually, um, I remember quite clearly starting to lose sleep over this long, uh, quite a long time ago when uh, instant messaging was was coming about because that was that was a fantastic development in the late-ish 1990s when I think at that time, finally, there were enough people online for enough of the time that you could reach them in this new instant way rather than by a kind of a store and forward email, uh, instant messaging uh, came about and you had, we suddenly had um, all of these uh, clients like ICQ and AIM, AIM, uh, AOL Instant Messenger and Yahoo and MSN and, and quite a few more, which quickly grew and suddenly we had all of these instant messaging services. But the thing that kind of made me um, despair at the time or gave me a lot of frustration was that they never collect, connected to each other. So they were, they were their own individual walled gardens. Uh, and even when a standard was available and Jabber or XMPP came along, even when that was available, it wasn't adopted. They didn't, those, those, um, those services didn't use the standard. And that was kind of uh, hugely disappointing uh, at the time for a lot of people, I think, who were working on that. And it was a lesson in the fact that good solutions don't always get used because it was actually deliberate. So every, every IM was its own walled garden. Um, it was a, a commercial decision that they that everyone wanted to be the, the best and the biggest and uh, and interconnection wasn't a priority. But for, for users, it was incredibly frustrating. And particularly coming out of a world of email where you contrast IM and, and email. And in the world of email, you had a you had a unique global address and you could um, connect to anyone with, an, with, uh, with another email address. And it didn't matter what email client you used, you could connect. So it was a terrible shame um, that IM couldn't go the same way. And it was a, it was a real a, a failure, I'd say, of standardization, of, not of the standards themselves, but of the whole process of, of committing to standards and adopting standards uh, for use by the internet at large collectively. 
and it just wasn't in the interests of those who who were um, who were producing IM um, services. But actually, since then, this that particular issue is really is a trivial case compared with what's going on on the internet since then, because as modern recent internet services have developed across a whole range of, of applications and, and um, communities and, and areas of, of requirement, all of them, well, the vast majority are walled gardens. Um, intelligence is not at the edges. Intelligence has been centralized into the services themselves. Um, more and more um, complexity is embedded in them and, and it's embedded in proprietary and ad hoc um, functions of those networks. And I, I say network um, because they, they are networks, they're overlay networks, things like we call them um, CDMs, constant, uh, cont content distribution networks. They are, they are networks of a kind, but they are propri proprietary closed walled garden networks. And um, so you don't, you don't have a standards approach. You don't have a distinction between, even between a, a, a service, a, a server and a client or a browser. I mean, there's no such thing, for instance, and this is sort of a failure of imagination, I think, that we don't even ask. There's no such thing as a Facebook client. Um, all there is is a proprietary website, a proprietary app um, accessed, accessing a completely walled garden, and there's no question of competition in the mechanisms that a user might want to use as a customer to access their data uh, because it's simply a walled garden and, and everyone accepts that with almost no, no question. And there's no question of, of being able to interface um, your own part of Facebook to any, anywhere else. The, the best we've been able to do, and this has been by arm twisting, I think, is that, is that users of, and I talk about Facebook here, but um, users are able to download the entire uh, content of their Facebook data as a kind of a, a, a huge mass of HTML and files, which takes you several days to assemble, and then you 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 have it, and that's it. And that's hardly a useful or meaningful way to share or have access to data, which is is yours. Um, and so I, I I would say if I could have meaningful access to my personal data on social media, it, it would have to be through an API. I mean, I I would want those companies to create an API allowing me to grant access to the data that I want, access to the data I want, to the people who I want to have, have access to that data. And I think if, if the monopolies of, of these platforms is going to be moderated in, in a meaningful way in favour of, of users, then it would have to be th through that kind of mandate with, with requirements to comply with those. Uh, because as we've, as we've seen, they certainly aren't um, acting by themselves towards um, those, um, those sorts of user-oriented aims. But as I said, the, the issue even, it goes further than I am and it goes further than instant messaging because you know, more recently we've got cloud services everywhere. We've got um, storage and processing and databases and artificial intelligence and all of this stuff embedded within proprietary overlay networks, proprietary services that sit within somewhere within the internet. And you know, none of it ever sits on your computer uh, on your phone, under your control or autonomy in any, in any way, the intelligence is, is not at the edges and, and it's not under your control. And when it comes to uh, these cloud services, I think to understand the scale of it, you just need to look at some of the market data. So I, I, I looked, um, I did a bit of searching on this and, and found some stats where um, showing that uh, the cloud, the worldwide cloud service market has grown from 15 billion to 250 billion in the last 10 years. But in the same time, the market for enterprise servers, you know, for people to own their own hardware and, and run it for their own business has, has stayed basically flat and is now at a third of that, um, at, of the rate of, of, of the market size of, of cloud services. And even data centers, which I still think of as pretty new and, and sort of vibrant as a business, they have flattened as well in, in recent years. That's the data centers run by, uh, not run by big platforms themselves, of course, those are booming. So I, I just think, um, I guess I'm, I'm calling out some really dramatic and widespread changes to this thing that we call the internet. It's really a very different internet from where we started. We still call it the internet and it's a bit of an illusion actually. It's a bit of a mystery to keep, to keep doing that because so much has changed in, in terms of the way the internet 
collectively works when it comes to openness and standardization and the original internet principles of, of open end-to-end -end, uh, intelligence at the edges, etc. So that's, uh, that's something that keeps me up at night. It keeps me up at night, both sort of in, in my concern for the internet and my own selfish interests as a, as, a, as a user who can be a bit impatient and a bit imaginative in what I'd, what I'd like to see. But um, speaking as an RIR, uh, you know, I could have spoken about IPv6 and even, even routing security, um, touch wood on that one, because um, those are important. But I have to say in the, the world of uh, network services and network operators, we actually seem to be maintaining and running networks and, and that infrastructure in a way that works. And so what really does worry me much more is what's happening at the next layers up in the internet services and applications where we really do seem to have lost touch with those open standards and those principles which were part of creating a vibrant um, a world of, of interoperability and, and innovation and so forth. Um, we've, instead, we've got, we're stuck in a world of monopoly services and applications and really no thought, I think, to, in, to interoperability or user autonomy or, or, or innovation. So I actually, I think, um, and I hope that there are standardization answers to, to a lot of these problems, to, to actually defining how, um, how our components of the network at all of these layers um, can be and need to be more open and more, oper more interoperable to create more competition and more innovation. And um, to do that, uh, at least in, in new emerging, emerging services, uh, if not in the older ones, but as for the incumbents, I guess, um, I'm afraid that just like in the, in the instant messaging world, um, open standards are not going to be of interest and won't be used without some, uh, without some strong arm twisting by way of regulation to, uh, to gently encourage um, adoption. I don't hold out too much hope for that, but uh, maybe once uh, we have an, have an IPv6 internet and a bit more access to innovation at the, at the very edges for, um, for people who want to innovate, we may have um, a bit of a turnaround and hopefully that'll start happening before uh, year 2040. Uh, that's about all I have, and I've blown my time. So thanks very much for your um, for your patience and your time and indulgence. And I'll hand it back to you, Kathy. Thanks, Paul. I think uh, Drew, if you got who's up next, does or are there, are there questions? There are Do we have time questions. for questions. Yeah, there are two questions. Maybe Paul, if you can take them very very quickly. Sure, sure, I can't see them. Can you? Yeah, I can read them out. The first one is from Glenn. The incident that occurred in, with Afrinic last year, does it impact the integrity of the RIRs? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure which incident um, you're referring to because there frankly have been a few, a few incidents at Afrinic over the last couple of years which relate either to um, there are um, some legal challenges that, that have been um, directed at them from IP address brokers um, and, a, and one security security issue. So I'm not quite sure, but I will say the, the RIRs are rallying around Afrinic very strongly and providing Afrinic with a, with a lot of support and, and certainly don't feel like it's an existential threat either to, to Afrinic or, or the RIRs. And the other one, I think we can, one, uh, we can take it uh, offline. Let's move on. Thank you, Paul, right. for a great talk. Okay, welcome, thank you. And let me share screen quickly. Yeah, uh, so let's start with our program. Uh, we have our first uh, uh, first presenter, uh, Bob, and Bob usually need no introduction. He is a co-inventor of IPv6. He's currently a, a fellow at Checkpoint Software. In his long history at ITF, he has in fact been part of many I-Star bodies. He was a chair of uh, Internet Society Board. He was part of the earlier, uh, the body that we used to call IOOC. He was part of IAB, he was on ISG. So there is a long uh, history uh, of Bob uh, working with uh, ITF. And it's good to hear directly from him about the past, present and future of IPv6 and where it's going. So off to you, Bob, uh, please share your screen. I'll stop sharing. Um, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Or should I put in a headset? No, I think you are clear. Your voice is good. All right, so let's see if this will work.
That's weird. Not seeing PowerPoint. Let me try that again. There we go. Yes, Bob. Uh, if you can make it full screen. Yes, I will. All right. Thank you. So you can see that okay? Yes. Good. I will start. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for having me. Um, as th And the nice introduction. I've been doing this for a while. I joined um, Bolt, Moranic, Bolt Moranic and Newman, BBN, in... Um, uh, like 1978, I did a little work on the at sort of the end of the ARPANET. I actually wrote a little bit of code that ran in the IMP for a while. Uh, and then I got involved in doing internet relating things, got to work with, um, or I like to say it, I got to work with the people who did invent the internet. So it was, um, it's been quite, um, quite a ride, so to speak, um, getting to be involved in something very early that has had such a big effect on the world. And as, um, as Paul said in his talk, it's, you know, I think it hasn't quite come out the way we, we were expecting. I think we were all sort of naive. Um, my, my, the thing that keeps me awake is there's really now in the application space, there's too much power in too few hands. And I don't know how to fix that, but my focus is mostly at the lower levels to make the packet slow. So with that, um, so I'm gonna provide a little background on IPv6, talk about how the ITF developed it, my view of its status today, and then give you some of my thoughts on what the, and how the enterprise transition will happen. And those are my personal opinions. They're not my employers or the ITFs. Um, and then a few conclusions on the whole process of developing IPv6. So um, in the early 1990s, it, it wasn't clear that what we, you know, the internet protocols, TCP, IP, were going to be successful. There were many bigger competitors. There was all the OSI protocols. There was ATM, at and Business said they were going to build an internet. Um, Bob Metcalf talked about the, how the internet was going to melt down. And if he didn't, if it didn't, he would eat his hat. He ended up eating his hat. Um, the ITF was not considered to be a standards organization. It wasn't you know, like OSI that was sort of um, official through the UN or, you know, it wasn't organized by countries. It was basically individuals. And one thing that was going on at the time, which is sort of hard to remember, is that not having a plan for what followed with IPv4 was a big issue. We could see very early on that there was going to be a problem with addresses. And so not having a plan sort of created an opening for other alternatives. Um, and these are, I have two slides that I produced when I was working for a startup called Ypsilon Networks back in the 93 timeframe or 95, I guess it says on the slide. And so we could see internet, the internet was growing over time, you know, exponentially. This, even it was happening then, and I think it's still happening now. Um, and then we were also, this is what I was talking about, about what was causing growth. And I think all of these things turned out to be true. Um, we could see what was driving it, you know, all computers, and this was before there was any real commerce um, or advertising on the net, but we could see it was coming. There were gonna be lots of countries who were not attached, were going to attach um, new industries and everything was gonna be networked. And I think this has all come, we were good about, this was the part we were quite good about seeing the future. Um, 
So the ITEF started working on this around 1990. We could see that the internet was growing exponentially. We were looking, starting to see certain classes of IP addresses being exhausted. Um, there was a group in 1991 called Road Routing and Addressing, um, and that ended up recommending the internet implements implemented CIDR and develop a new version of IP. We called it IP Next Generation. Um, and then after that, the Internet Architecture Board of the time decided they knew better than the ITF community and came up with their own solution. They called it IP version 7. Um, and this came to be known as the Kobe incident, which is like a whole talk on its, on its own. But uh, this was not accepted by the ITF, and it ended up restructuring how the ITF was organized, the, the, the ITF ended up having responsibility for standards. It was taken away from the IB and the IB has sort of never been the same. Um, so in 92, the I, ITF issued a call for, for IP next generation proposals. Um, the ISG took on that responsibility. There was an area formed, Scott Bradner and Allison Mankin. Um, uh, with the area directors and RFC 1550 was published, which had the requirements. And then a year later, there was a recommendation. So there were many candidates um, and some of these, I actually still remember what they were about. Some I don't. Um, there was one called IP version seven by Rob Ullman that ended up having a couple different names over time. Um, and that's one I don't remember too much about. Tubo, that was led by Ross Callen, um, that was basically TCP over the CLMP connection list, the ISO CLS, ISO connection list uh, internet protocol. And then there was a series of projects that I was involved with, one called NCAPS. Steve Deering um, proposed Simple IP. Um, Paul Francis called, had one called PIP, uh, sometimes we called it Paul's IP for Paul's Fran Paul Francis, and those, several of those projects merged into SIP with two Ps, and that, that became the basis for IPv6. And you might wonder about these, the version numbers, you know, why, why it's called IPv4 and IPv6. Well, here are the version numbers. Uh, that are currently assigned, though so some of these are now historic. So four is for internet protocol IPv4. Um, five was actually a not really an internet protocol. It was called the streams protocol. It was used for real-time um, audio and video experimentation. Uh, six was assigned to SIP, which eventually became IP version six. Seven was for TPIX catnip, PIP got eight and TUBA got nine. And you can see we have um, many left to assign if we wanna create more internet protocols. Um, one question that comes up a lot with, you know, you know, backwards compatibility with IPv4. Well, the way I like to talk about this is, we were limited by what was basically in IP version four and that the main transition mechanism was this version number. So, you know, that's how you can tell which protocol it is on the wire. It's how a host or router can tell what it is. And that's the, the basic mechanism we use. There was no mechanism in IPv4 to support larger addresses or, you know, so there, there really weren't many choices. Many things have been talked about, but you know this was examined a lot, and we did what made sense, which was to use the transition mechanism that was in IPv4. Um, so CIDR, which it turned out that I think to have, was very important for the routing in the internet. Um, we the internet protocols were originally designed with very fixed boundaries in the way IP addresses were allocated and they were, uh, they were allocated in a way, a way that I would call was flat. You had to basically carry every network 
in your routing table. Um, and so this was a different approach to allocate blocks of IP addresses to, to providers, to ISPs. We now call these prefixes. Um, and the routing protocols were modified to aggregate these routes to a single provider. So instead of, you know, if a particular ISP had a hundred or a thousand different prefixes, they could all be aggregated to one. And this may this really helped um, making routing much more efficient um, in the backbone. So this turned out to be very important. Um, and then I'll talk about SIP, which really became the basis for IPv6. Um, it was proposed by Steve Deering, um, and more recently this was documented. So there was never an RFC published at the time. Uh, it was published in RFC 8507. Um, technically, I, I still think it is the cleanest design of all the proposals. Um, it had 64-bit addresses, basically twice the number of bits as IPv4, but it also kept the header size at the same size as IPv4. So it was very, um, I thought that was a very nice design. And it did this by simplifying the header, removing fragmentation and the options that were in IPv4. Um, a very simple, clean design. The questions about it were really about address size. Were, was the address space big enough? But I think in hindsight, had we gone with this, the transition from IPv, IPv4 would have been much simpler. It would have looked a lot more like everything the way IPv4 worked, but just with bigger addresses. But um, that's not quite what happened. Um, the biggest debate towards the end was basically about address size. Um, you know, how big they should be, should they be fixed or variable length? Um, SIP proposed fixed length 64-bit addresses. It met all the requirements in the requirements document by quite a lot. It kept the packet size the same. It was the same size header. Uh, it was also very efficient for software processing. Um, the variable length addresses were basically using the OSI NSAP address, which were variable length up to 160 bits, clearly much larger than 64. Um, and this also had the advantage of allowing you to auto configure addresses using IEEE MAC addresses, which turned out to be more complicated later as we discovered with IPv6. Um, and in theory, you could start with short addresses and grow later. Um, the compromise, you know, this was a committee, so there was a compromise. The compromise was on fixed length 128-bit addresses. So basically making SIPs addresses twice as big. And the assumption was that that would meet all of the requirements that anyone could foresee. Um, I think this was the right decision. I think the problem with variable length is they are a lot more complicated. And the only, the practice with the CLNP protocol was, while it did have a variable length address plan, the way it was deployed was with fixed length addresses. So there, there wasn't any operational experience with variable length addresses. And I, so I think we did the right thing. So the, the IP next generation recommendation was to make it based on SIP with two Ps with 128 bit addresses. Uh, and a working group was created in the ITF to, to standardize it. The initial chairs were Steve Deering and Ross Callan. Ross again was the chair of the TUBA group. And this was an attempt to bring the two communities together. And then I was appointed document editor. And later Ross dropped out. I became um, the co-chair with Steve. Uh, and the goal was to resolve the remaining issues, you know, complete unfinished work and move to proposed standard. And the first IPv6 RFC as a st proposed standard was published in December, 1995. Quite a long time ago. I, I think I will admit at this point that had anyone then known how long and hard this was going to be, we probably all would have 
gone and worked on something else, but we didn't. So Steve, I think, is smarter than me. He retired and uh, was living up in Vancouver, and I'm still at it. So we were correct about um, running out of IPv4 addresses. <clears throat> the last allocation from the IANA free pool was the end of January in 2011. And so that everyone could see this was happening, and it did happen. Um, and so right now, this was stats I pulled um, last week. Um, Google is seeing access to Google, uh, user access to Google, about just a little less than 40% of their traffic. Um, and and that there's similar numbers from other large content providers like Facebook and YouTube and all of the other, all of the others. So this is, um, you know, this graph, I look at it periodically and it seems to keep going up. We see this, you know, you'd notice in the bottom, you see sort of variation. And I think it varies based on whether people are working at home or um, at work. Um, but we, I think we saw it get more steady during the pandemic because more people working at home. It's just, I found sort of interesting. So there, you know, this has come a long way. You know, it's not getting close to half of access to sites like Google. And so this by one means is very successful. Um, these are some, um, the ISOC at the World IPv6 launch keeps track of ISP. Um, percentage of usage and they, these are some it's a very long list and so I just pull pulled some of these just to show you um, you know you see a lot of mobile operators um, with very high percentages a lot of mobile phone operators are basically just running IPv6 inside and translate to IPv4 at the edge where needed um, you can see Comcast being very high basically especially organizations who, who have run out of um, private IPv4 addresses have switched over big time. So there are a lot of large ISPs that have very high IPv6 numbers. And then here's also some countries, um, also a very long list. These are some of the highest, but I sort of, it's a scattering around the world. India, I think is, has the highest percentage of IPv6 usage now, US 41%, Malaysia 49%, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, so it's not just the US or just Japan. It, you know, this is becoming spread around the world. Um, another recent thing that happened is, so the ITAP has sort of two steps in its standards process. There's proposed standard and then standard. There used to be a third called draft standard, but so the ITF published IPv6 as a full internet standard in July of 2017. Um, and it was published as RFC 8200, very easy to remember. So there, there is no, uh, it's no longer proposed, it's real. But we knew that all along. Um, all major platforms support IPv6, Mac OS, Windows, Linux, Android, iOS, you name it, they all have it. Um, most routers, switches, and firewalls support it, uh, or probably all. Um, may, as I talked about with Google, major content providers provide IPv6. Um, and, you know, Google, Netflix, Facebook, all. And this is where most of the traffic in the internet is today. Um, so a lot of most of that is going on IPv6. And the way the way that most ISPs support this, users don't know what protocol they're using. And if it's very likely, if you're you connect using any of these services, your that traffic is flowing over IPv6. And so for um, the the global internet from, you know, users at home to content providers, you know, it's 
be, being used very widely. Um, most large ISPs support it. Um, CDNs now provide IPv6 access to IPv4 only sites. And this has made it very easy for a lot of, um, you know, next level content providers to, to, to allow their traffic, their content to be provided with IPv6. Um, Amazon Web Services now supports it. I believe the other similar organizations are doing it. And the last thing is there starting to be some large enterprises are looking at IPv6 only, and I'm gonna talk about that more later. Ah, I guess I'm gonna talk about it now. Um, so enterprise networks today, um, the majority of them are IPv4 only inside. There's very little, um, there might be some dual stack, but mostly it's just IPv4. Um, the, Basic structure is IPv4 inside with private addresses. Um, there's some that have some public addresses too, but most, most don't. Um, there's a NAT and firewall at the administrative edge. Um, public, and, there, and it uses public IPv4 addresses at the outside edge. Um, and there's basically little transition little motivation to transition to IPv4 if they can use, if they fit well into the RFC 1918 private address space, because it, it works. They don't, um, there's not a problem they have. They're used to doing it. It's painful in a lot of ways, but it does work and people are trained to do it. Um, there are, however, some large enterprises that have exceeded the private address limits. So this is what the very simplified picture looks like. You know, enterprise address, enterprise with private addresses, firewall NAT at the edge, and then, you know, with public addresses on the outside. So I, I, my thoughts on this, and these are my thoughts alone, that they're not, they've, it's not what the ITF thinks, it's not what Checkpoint thinks. Um, I think if there are a few other places who are starting to think this way. Um, you know, public IPv4 addresses are limited and getting the ones that are available in private markets are expensive. Um, the way to get around IPv6 is you have multiple layers of NAT. That makes for a very, for a slower and what I think is fragile internetworking experience. If one of the boxes with all of that current translate, translation state fails, then all the connections are broken. Um, so I think that IPv6 only will become the model for enterprise networks. The structure of this will be IPv6 inside, uh, basically without IPv4, with public IP you know, using either public IPv6 addresses or probably or ULAs, depending on whether they want to get them from their from providers or themselves from directly from the registries, um, or they could use unique local addresses, ULAs. They'll again be a firewall NAT at the administrative boundary, and they'll have public IPv4 and v6 addresses at the outside edge. I mean, it's a very similar structure. Here's the picture. Um, and there's basically, this will allow IPv6 direct connections to the to all the sites on the internet that um, support IPv6. You know, there'll be a firewall, so they have all of the protection that the enterprise needs, but that's done today anyway. And then there will also be the ability to translate from IPv6 to IPv4. So the remaining sites that are only IPv4 can still be reached. It's easy, relatively easy to translate from the large address space to the smaller address space. You just can't do it the other way around. Um, and so this is what I think enterprises will end up looking. I, have long since stopped making time-based predictions, but I think this makes a lot of sense to me. Um, there's a number of operational advantage. It's a single um, 
IP protocol to manage inside, just like people do today. It's, you know, instead of dual stack, you just have to do one. Um, you learn, you have to learn how to do it, but given that I think all operating systems and devices supported, it's quite feasible. Um, you get direct IPv6 end to end for most internet content. This will provide faster, more reliable service. Um, you get, but you still get access to all IPv4 internet destinations and that service is exactly like you have today. It's basically one address space translated to another address space. So it's that service should be pretty much exactly the same as you do today, but you get direct IPv6. And then for um, organizations that have large blocks of, of public IPv6 addresses, you can sell them in today's market. So um, there's an opportunity to recoup if you don't wait too long. Right now they have a lot of um, value if you wait too long, that I think that will go away. But in the meantime, companies who do this first may be able to use the revenue they get from selling the addresses to pay for the transition. So I have several conclusions from this um, journey. Uh, uh, so, and some next steps first. I think the next steps we'll start to see mid-size organizations starting to support IPv6. We're seeing some of this now. I'm sort of surprised when I, sometimes I go to a site that I use that I discover it's now reachable with IPv6. Um, enterprises, as I just talked about, smaller ISPs. There's a lot of work in the IoT space. Um, there's a lot of new initiatives that are being announced with IoT devices that are based on IPv6. But the, we're still seeing some products coming with v4 only. I think this is going is becoming less and less, but it hasn't happened yet. So I think there's there's clearly still more to do. So I have a few conclusion slides. Um, we were correct about running out of IPv4 addresses. Um, I think what we didn't understand was what the impact of network address translation would be. I think without that, the transition would have happened a lot sooner, but this meant um, you, people could delay it. Um, so we, weren't, we were not right about how long it would take to develop IPv6 when exactly the addresses would run out and particularly how hard and long it was to deploy. Um, part of this, I think, was that the internet was growing very rapidly and people were focused on that, not, not in changing internet protocols. But we did make IPv6 happen by building a broad community of motivated and dedicated people around the world. Um, Steve Daring and I figured out very early in the process that we couldn't do this all ourselves. We need to get lots of other people who wanted to make it happen and get them to work on it. And then they would get more people to work on it. And that, that's what had happened. We, the goal was not to be in charge of this. The goal was just to facilitate it happening. Um, we clearly back in the late nineties did not anticipate how the internet would change. When we first did this, it was still largely engineering driven. Um, it was, you know, no longer, it was no, but it, it was no longer build it and they will come. People built stuff and didn't worry about what the business case was. Now everything needs to have a business case. There has to be a reason to do it. For a lot of the industry was in denial that this was needed for a long time. Um, I think this has changed, but it was clear, it was clearly hard to get people's attention for a very long time. I think it was the RARs handing out the last block of IPv4 addresses that got a lot of people to change from, do we need to do this to when are we gonna do it? And I also note this was a very kind of transition that uh, no one really had done before, at least that I'm aware of. And so it's not surprising to discover it was hard. Um, another note, is that 
On the internet, it's very hard to deploy anything new that requires global deployment before it's useful. Um, you know, and that's exactly what IPv6 is. You know, deploying two sites with IPv6 is not useful. You need to get everyone to do it or large numbers of people as we're seeing today. Um, anything new needs an immediate return. Basically, it has to solve um, a local problem before it can solve a global problem. You know, I think the expression is think globally, act locally. Um, so I worked, and just for comparison, I worked on another protocol in the ITF called Virtual Router Redundancy Protocol. And that had just the opposite characteristics as IPv6, because you only needed to deploy it in two routers for it to be useful. And so this meant it got deployed very quickly, but it only got deployed where people wanted it, but it did, it provided a feature, you know, for a router redundancy. And it didn't require everyone in the world to do it before it became useful. And so that, that's something that I, the difference is something I became quite aware of in working on IPv6. But I think largely, you know, the deployment we're seeing with IPv6 as that it has become a local problem. People, large organizations need um, more addresses and that's what IPv6 does. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Uh, that was an excellent talk. Uh, I don't see any Q&A here, but uh, I request maybe we have some time, maybe folks from the panel feel free to unmute and ask your questions and have a little bit of discussion. I'm not seeing anybody picking up that up. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, unmute yourself. Yeah, sure, thanks Dhruv. Uh, so hi Bob, uh, uh, Mohit here and it was an excellent presentation. Just wanted to ask you about one question. Um, what do you think about the IPv6 deployments uh, in the universities? Uh, we have a lot of university campus networks that are huge in size. Uh, do you have any kind of uh, data or any suggestions or any pointers to uh, that part? Um, that's a good question. I, I actually don't. I should look into that. I haven't followed them um, recently. Are you aware of any? Um, yes, I was working on uh, migrating my campus network. Uh, I, I'm a uh, faculty member in one of the universities in India, and mm -hmm. I'm working towards the IPv6 migration in our campus. Uh, thanks to IIESOC and IMTC, they have been helping me a lot. So uh, while I was doing this, I came across a couple of uh, uh, articles and papers in which uh, a survey was conducted. Uh, I can maybe share it with you. But I yeah, I, I would like to see that. That sure. is very interesting because I mean, universities are also very much like large enterprises. They're different in a lot of ways too, but they are, you know, some of them have very large networks that serve a lot of diverse people and applications. Sure. Thanks, Bob. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Bob. Uh, uh, the comparison between IPv6 and VRRP brought a question uh, to my mind about. IPv6 being there on the public internet end to end, but it's also used in you know what is being called as limited domains uh, now uh, within uh, you know close uh, pr uh, networks uh, providers or enterprises. Mm -hmm. What's your view on how IPv6 should uh, evolve uh, to address this uh, seemingly disparate uh, requirements for these two networks, the global internet and the limited domains? Well. I mean, I don't see it as a difference. I think, you know, you, if you can do it, use it for the global internet, you can use it in private domains as well. Just, well, IPv4 is used that way too. So I think it's just different. You know, we have, um, you know, if you're going to use it privately, you could you can use either put, get public addresses, which you can get from RARs, uh, or you can use ULAs. Um, which work if you don't want to connect things, you can do that. So there's a way of having unique addresses that you can use internally in the private domain um, and keep it separate. So I, I think we allow, uh, I don't have any um, objection to private domains. It's um, just another way of using the internet or using the internet technology, I guess. 
So uh, as a follow on, I mean, my, uh, I agree on the addressing part, but uh, what was your view on some features to be added to IPv6 that may not be uh, applicable or may not be usable on the global internet, but uh, may work on the in limited domains? Well, I think that, um, I think later on, was it today or tomorrow, there's going to be a lot of talk about extension headers. And the, the, a lot of extension headers don't work well on the global internet for a variety of reasons, some of which we're trying to fix. But in a private domain, you have more control over what every node does, or at least in theory you do. Um, and so you could, in a private domain, you could probably have extension headers or hop by hop options that maybe don't work on the uh, global internet, but will work quite fine in a private domain. I mean, we're currently, it's currently in the ISG, we're proposing a path MTU option, hop by hop header option that initially is thought to be very useful in, you know, sort of in, in domains, in private domains that have want to have large, a mixture of large and smaller MTUs where we, we know that it's not going to work well on the global internet, but, you know, in a particular network, uh, it should work quite well because you can, you can make sure that all the routers on the path and the host support it. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the Good. question. Folks. Uh, off to you, Kathy. I'll share the screen so that you can introduce the next speaker. Yeah, so we're really excited to have Paul Vixie here. Until really recently, he was the CEO and co-founder of Farsight Security. He's done a, a lot of work um, with the DNS and open source software like Bind. Um, and he also founded the first anti-spam company in 1996 and the first nonprofit internet infrastructure company in 1994. Um, Paul's here to talk about the security and privacy implications due to the loss of visibility of some of the new security protocols that are coming out, um, TLS 1.3 and uh, DNS over HTTP and stuff. So we're really excited to have him here and I won't waste any more time, but um, we're super excited to hear his talk. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Kathy. Um, is my sound okay? It is. All right, then. Can't see your, there you are. Hey. All right. So, uh, let me th start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. Um, this topic is vital, but uh, geeky. And so it's, it's been difficult to find audiences who are willing to sit through it. And, um, and yet it is, as I say, vital. Um, by going dark, I simply mean that the traffic that is passing over uh, managed private networks and other networks as well, but specifically managed private networks, such as a home or a business, government agency, that kind of thing, uh, is going to become pretty much impossible to differentiate or to detect uh, problems or attacks or whatever. And this is by design, but perhaps with some consequences that were not, uh, not intended. Um, so I'm here to sort of sound the alarm a little bit. Um, there are some things that uh, site security administrators can do. I'll get to that at the end. None of them are appetizing. Um, and it is, in my opinion, uh, high time for those of us who depend on things like firewalls uh, for our, our uh, site security, uh, begin to make plans. So, um, uh, there really isn't such a thing as effective modern site security. And, um, you know, what I mean by that is that it used to be effective, um, but the modern site is almost never secure. In other words, something that is using all of the most modern technology, most modern protocols, is almost always uh, bypassing older security agents, uh, older security methods. And so it is today. Um, so 
what we can do at this point is behavioral security. In other words, we don't necessarily know what data patterns are good or bad, right? The idea of pattern matching in um, uh, endpoint security is kind of passe. There are still companies who sell it and other companies who do it, but generally the bad guys who are generating bad things understand that they can't use the same pattern too often or it will become ineffective. And so they don't. And it's important to realize that um, everything we do to secure our networks or our devices uh, becomes kind of a virtual roadmap for those who would attack us. And um, so, you know, I would love it if we could come up with an idea that was so good and yet still practical that uh, would cause pretty much evildoers everywhere to say, okay, that's it, game over. I will go get a real job now. It's uh, pointless to try to attack people over the internet anymore. I'd love to reach that point. I don't see it coming, uh, not in my lifetime and not afterward. So what we do is we look at the, how endpoints behave. In other words, the places where packets and flows are coming from or going to uh, we don't know exactly who's operating them. It uh, could be that it's a you know, member of the family, a member of the company, a customer, but it could also be an intruder, malicious outsider, uh, malicious insider, um, uh, malware, poison supply chain, or a lot of different things that can cause an endpoint to no longer be trustworthy. And so we cannot simply say, well, I trust this endpoint, therefore it can do anything it wants. That that would be crazy. I know there are people who do it because that's what they can afford, but um, for a typical managed private network, that is not the case. And so uh, to be behavioral, security simply means that you're looking at the signals, the information that is uh, emitted by an endpoint or emitted elsewhere that is then consumed by an endpoint. And you know when, when that's your fallback, when you've been pushed out of every other thing you were trying to do because of technology marching on, uh, if that's where you are, there are some <clears throat> terrific weaknesses which you will have to address. Um, and probably what underlies all of those weaknesses is that uh, breakage of rules or laws, whether they're corporate policies or government policies or laws, um, breaking those things is a local matter. Uh, in other words, normally those rules, those laws apply locally, but they are not universal. Uh, there are very few uh, codas in human law which are universal, right? Action against online uh, child sexual abuse would be an example of something that is near universal and even sort of countries that you might think of as uh, intolerant of freedom or uh, ignorant of laws or disrespectful of laws uh, have all pretty much come together and said, yeah, for children and sex online, that's a problem. And we're all gonna work together on that even while we sort of secretly fight it out on in, in other battlefields. Um, but other than that, you know, your rules are local. The people who you'd like to have abiding by them are not. Um, and that underlies all of the problems uh, that a site security administrator could have. And um, that in turn means that the ethical status, is it good, is it bad, of any given signal uh, is not universal. Uh, what is bad for the site security administrator might seem good to a malicious insider or uh, to malware, poison supply chain, you know, whatever. Um, and we, we have to take account of that. We can't just say the internet uh, recognizes ethics and is built into the protocol or whatever. No, that, that isn't true at all. Uh, the internet becomes an accelerator for whatever someone wanted to do uh, before the internet. And um, not everybody who wants to do things in the world is your friend. I wish I could uh, say that that seems obvious. Uh, it might seem obvious to you, but um, it's not. People routinely say that uh, there should be no controls. Uh, firewalls are passe. Uh, you should secure your endpoints. You should educate your users and so on. 
that's not the real world. And um, so that's an argument I get into from time to time. Uh, in any case, uh, behavioral security is therefore seen by some as too little. Generally, a site security administrator who's trying to create some information assurance uh, would say, this is bogus. This is not enough. I'm, you know, we're losing and we're going to keep losing. Whereas it is seen as too much by others. Um, too little for those defending, too much for those trying to bypass. Um, and that, that is universal. That condition will always obtain. So I do want to give you some background, uh, similar to Mr. Hendon's description of how IPv6 came to be and you know, what were its uh, forcing functions. Uh, let me tell you how things got this bad. <clears throat> uh, it has to do with complexity. In other words, the number of different pieces of hardware and software, uh, di different protocols, different versions of protocols, uh, all the different configurations, they sort of, you know, if you view this as a distributed system with a whole bunch of state variables all over the place, uh, what you'd say is that that distributed system should have achieved consciousness by now because it has so many state variables that no one could possibly understand it. I know computers are very powerful and it's possible there's a computer uh, somewhere that might be able to tell you things about the internet if only it could gather all this information, but you can't. Uh, the information you would need to build a model to help you understand what this thing is doing is unavailable. And so it uh, doesn't really matter you know, what you could do if you had that information, you won't. Uh, but all of this stuff goes into a blender and that blender is set to liquefy. Um, so you know what you're getting moment by moment on the internet is hard to predict. Yeah, not just practically, but theoretically hard to predict, which means assurance will be elusive. So add to that sort of extreme churn among the vendors who bring products uh, that might speak modern protocols and maybe try to speak old ones as well. Uh, those vendors come and go. Um, and the versions of software and hardware uh, constantly in flux. A lot of things have a very long tail. There are plenty of things that have been fixed uh, in the modern product, but uh, there are still 15 or 20 year old versions of that type of thing out there that will never be upgraded. And we don't really have a way of uh, expiring them and saying, no, you're just too old. Uh, we, we can't, <laughs> we just can't let you on the internet anymore. There's, there's no gate for that. And then you've got constant patching. You know, that some people are patching every day, some are patching every year. Uh, some are ignoring the patches that they don't like or they don't understand because it might break something they depend on. And personnel constantly coming and going, not just security personnel, but all of the other information workers uh, that have something to say about what's connected to the internet and how it behaves. Um, so that is a complexity overload. And that is, as far as I can tell, the principal cause of the fact that site security is kind of ineffective, right? So when I talk about behavioral security, I want you to understand that was not the ideal situation. Um, that was simply all we're left with. And um, that means the confidence in your safety is probabilistic. Um, a lot of sites assume and some sites even know that they have been breached and that their equipment is being used by people and agents and so forth that uh, intend harm. And yet there's nothing they can really do. They can't just shut it off. There's a government agency called the Office of uh, Personnel Management that uh, was famously breached. I think uh, they accused China of this. And um, it came out in the investigation that they knew they were breached and they had known for at least six months, but the only way that they could have fixed it was to spend money that wasn't in their budget and turn everything off for about six months and or maybe three months, maybe a year or whatever for a long time in order to really sort of strip mine the vulnerabilities uh, out of their configurations and out of their, their, their software and hardware and so forth 
But again, they didn't have the money and it would have been very difficult for them to tell uh, the rest of the administration, yeah, you can't hire anybody, including in the military, and you can't have any promotions, including in the military, while we sort this out. That doesn't work. And that's not uh, rare. There are plenty of other companies who know that they are being, their, their network and their servers are being abused and uh, it, it can't do much about it. Um, and the things that you would do to combat this complexity and to try to bring some kind of uh, statistical knowledge, like, gee, it's good or it's bad, it's gotten better, it's gotten worse, that kind of thing, uh, would be the stuff that kind of isn't interesting. It's not what people sort of enter this field to say, yeah, I really want to make sure backups are done and done well, because if ransomware happens, we want to be able to restore from backups instead of paying for, you know, paying the, the, the ransom and getting our keys. Um, that's just not motivating. I mean, there are a small number of people who get excited about that kind of thing, but there are not enough of them uh, by maybe six or seven orders of magnitude to actually address this problem. Um, and that means if you wanna do this, it's expensive. And so you have to have a lot more at stake. You have to have a lot to lose. In other words, you might have to be a military network or a managed uh, information security provider or a cloud provider uh, in order to be able to hire enough people and allocate enough budget to do this well. And you know that's, it's good that there is a way to do it well, but I gotta say that way is out of reach for the average, let's say family, trying to protect their children online. Um, they, they don't have a big budget. They can't hire people to do that. Same thing for most medium to small companies. So you know, last but not least, we're in a bit of a war here. It's like the Cold War. In other words, it won't end. It's just the, the conditions which obtain is that um, people trying to defend this are spending money if they have any, if they can, but that is a cost center for them. And the people who are trying to attack our stuff, yeah, I guess they have some costs also, but to them, it's a profit center. And what that means is if you're in the business of attacking things, you never stop, you never do anything else unless it's to, I don't know, uh, go buy a, a yacht or uh, expensive sports car and uh, go enjoy all of the money that you've stolen. That might be something you do, but the rest of the time you're attacking because it's a profit center. Whereas for those of the, us who defend, it's a cost center. I mean, perhaps it's a, it's a revenue center. Uh, I get paid, for example. And I want to mention, although I am part of Amazon Web Services security team as of a week ago, I'm not here representing them. I'm, I'm representing my own personal views. Uh, but even so, um, I will try to do other things. Uh, most defenders will try to do other things besides just sit there and watch syslogs all day. And so, you know, that, those are the conditions which brought us here. Um, and I, I wish I could sort of get this to be well understood by more people who develop new technology so that they would say, gee, things are bad. Maybe it should be like a physician. I should first do no harm. Maybe when I you know, create new technology, I should uh, try to make things better or at least not make them worse, uh, alas. So in 2013, a man named Edward Snowden disclosed some uh, pretty significant uh, behaviors by the National Security Agency uh, of, of his government and did so from the country of Hong Kong and then quickly moved on to Russia in order to uh, avoid extradition. Um, and, you know, a lot of people were pretty panicked by this. Right? If you don't know what nation states do, which is to use every tool at their disposal to gain and keep power, um, then it could see, you could panic quite a bit. You could say, wow, I, I had no idea that kind of thing was going on. Uh, you should have. We should all have understood that uh, no tool will go unused by nation states. 
Um, the, their uh, moral standards are set by the political party in control and by their constitution, um, not so much by the way that individuals might determine what is right and wrong. But in any case, a lot of people were new to this, did not understand that this is the way the world works, and so they panicked. And in their panic, they invited Mr. Snowden to give a plenary speech at an IETF meeting. Now, the IETF, which Bob has mentioned, is the Internet um, Engineering Task Force, and it is where Internet protocols come from. Bob described IPv6, but everything comes from there. Um, if, if you want to use a protocol that isn't a standard, uh, you could do it, but you probably would have to make an open source implementation of it in order to have a large enough installed base for your innovation to be relevant. Um, so generally speaking, if you can get the IETF to believe something, then you're going to be able to change the future of the internet. And that's what happened here. Um, now, there are a lot of RFCs which have been influenced by these events, but the two important ones are 7258, uh, which identifies pervasive monitoring as an attack. Um, again, this might seem obvious, but it, <laughs> it wasn't, so, uh, so they had to write it up. And then the other one was 8890, which uh, came from a member of the Internet Activities Board. I'm not sure that the Internet Activities Board uh, stands behind this, but nevertheless, it has the imprimatur of this. And uh, the, the ideas represented there are that the internet is for end users. Um, so those of us who build and operate networks uh, are no longer seen as autonomous. We are, we are supposed to serve the end users, presumably our own, but possibly end users everywhere. And the things that a site security administrator might want to do with their network configuration, which are somehow not in the best service of end users, kind of are expected to uh, die out. Kind of, we're kind of told that in the end, firewalls will be irrelevant and the internet will be a free for all. Um, this is a problem. And those of you who manage uh, these managed private networks can probably uh, begin to predict the rest of my talk because no carve outs were made in this thinking for the monitoring by a site security administrator, something that uh, you might do in order to find out what's going on and whether it's good or bad. Uh, we're not specifically targeted by the IETF or by Mr. Snowden's various remarks. Uh, but they will certainly be affected. And the reason is that there is no distance whatsoever between a site security administrator and an oppressive authoritarian government trying to prevent free speech. The things that we as uh, administrators of uh, managed private networks want to do are the same things that uh, authoritarian governments want to do. And so the only way to permit one is to permit both and both cannot be permitted according to these RFCs. Uh, so uh, we are kind of the baby that's going out with the bathwater in that sense. Also, no distinction was made between actual end users, you know, members of your family, employees, customers, and intruders, right? The same level of autonomy and uh, freedom of expression and freedom of uh, transit must be afforded to all because if you can tell the difference between one and another at the network level, then that goes back to being what authoritarian governments might want to do. And um, so this really, it means the end of behavioral security. And I think I mentioned that behavioral security was not a good thing, but it's all we had. And now we don't even have that. Um, Finally, no awareness was shown of the benefits this would have to surveillance capitalists and the ability to collect information without necessarily having to follow the law when doing it, um, if there is indeed a law, uh, or follow network policy when doing it. Uh, malware also, no awareness was shown of malware. The idea that uh, an endpoint might gain some software that its end user doesn't know about and that it might behave according to the desires of the malware and its authors and, and operators, and not according to the uh, end users, 
was not considered when RFC 8890 was crafted. So that is kind of what occasions this talk. It's what I want to make everybody aware of. Um, and I, I want to mention one more thing about sort of how all this is so possible. Um, the internet, as Bob described, was kind of a way to avoid all of us having to speak uh, X.400 and X.25 and all the other X. things that came from the ITU, which were technically not very meritorious, but at least they were politically uh, proper. Um, so there, there wasn't going to be a really gigantic team of people who would have time to sort of red team every design and test every idea and so forth. No, that's not the way it worked at all. Uh, you kind of briefly socialized what you intended to do and came up with a proof of concept. And the only thing the IETF really cared about, at least in those days, is uh, are there multiple interoperable implementations of the thing that you're saying? And um, once there were, then it could go out and you know, get an RFC number and uh, be part of the growing internet market force. Um, so there was no other way to do this. I don't want to sound like I'm complaining. And you know, if, if this reminds you a little bit of open source, just realize the term open source was not crafted until much later, but the idea was, uh, was present. And this is another instance of the same idea. Um, what this in turn led to is an economy of design. They didn't, we didn't have a lot of rules. Um, we had some questionable rules, uh, like be conservative in what you accept, which might be spam, but uh, no, excuse me, be liberal in what you accept, which might be spam, but be conservative in what you generate in case you're not a spammer. Um, so these ideas were sort of very scientific. They were correct for an academic audience that was the original seed corn for the internet. I don't think that's working out so well for us now based on the size of the security industry at least. Um, but also quite tellingly, the protocols that were used to move certain kinds of things around like SMTP for email or DNS for domain names didn't have sort of one thing if you were an end user on an endpoint inside of a secure private network, you know, one protocol for that, and then one, a different protocol if you were talking outside, uh, or if some agent of yours uh, was talking outside, it's all the same thing. And what that meant is that when that differentiation had to occur, it was hard to put in without breaking things. And so what we have is <clears throat> some things that are broken and then a bunch of other stuff we'd like to do that we can't. Um, and that, in, that makes these protocols uh, just, uh, that's part of the long tail I was talking about earlier. Uh, we are gonna be dealing with uh, the installed base forever. And it's not gonna be possible to have a flag day again ever and say, okay, on this day, everything that hasn't been upgraded is gonna stop working. It isn't in anyone's interest to go along with that, right? They would lose customers. They would, you know, anger customers. Uh, they would anger their family, et cetera. So that means that um, the idea of firewalls was not in the original design. The idea of uh, NAT, network address translation, or ALGs, application layer gateways, or proxies. These are all things that have been added, but every one of them is actually kind of a, a rules violation in order to, uh, to get that in there at all, which that means there are some things that get broken when you put in NAT or firewall or whatever. And I don't mean the things you intend to break. I mean, things that you wish would keep working can't in that environment. Um, and so it's a bit of a wild, wild west. You know, the, the, whoever's got the, the best ability to deploy technology tends to win these races. Um, and so, yeah, as I said, we're breaking rules in order to secure our stuff. And um, what this means is that if you are a passionate defender of human freedom and you are really upset about the way the world is turning and the way it works, as has been now revealed to you, uh, you can't sit still and say, well, if that's the way the world has always worked, then I guess I'll just live that way. No. Um, the people who are 
uh, responding to these RFCs and people who are writing these RFCs are uh, of stout heart and they want what is best for humanity itself. And they know how to make a change and they are making that change. And uh, basically the change they're making is to increase signal entropy. Uh, and uh, encryption is an example of that, but the idea is to make something uh, indistinguishable. So there is a formal definition. In fact, there are a lot of formal definitions of entropy. Um, and I just wanna sort of mention in passing that encryption is only one way to increase entropy, but what it does is it increases the number of original clear text forms that could have resulted in a given encrypted form. Um, so if you have poor encryption, that means it's gonna be relatively easy to figure out what the clear text was that went into that. Whereas if you have really good encryption, and we do, um, then it becomes impossible to tell what the clear text was, no matter how many instances you have or how many samples you take. And um, so just, you can think of it as uh, how mixed up did things become, but that's what's happening. We are uh, trying to create well, there's no such thing as perfect entropy, but we're trying to create effectively maximum entropy in order to frustrate pervasive monitoring, including the monitoring that a site security administrator might wish to do. And they're doing this on purpose uh, with passion uh, for reasons they consider good and proper. And that's, they're making the world. Here's an example. Um, we're now encrypting DNS as it goes over the wire. Um, and we're putting it inside of HTTPS, which is the secure uh, web protocol that's used for virtually everything, not just e-commerce, but almost everything. And um, what they're trying to do is to prevent on-path devices from interfering with DNS operations. Um, this is different from the previous encrypted DNS protocol, which was DNS over TLS. Um, DNS over TLS is just as secure uh, if you're willing to let people know that it, that it is DNS and they can block it if they want. Uh, but otherwise, it's you know it's the same encryption, it's the same same stuff. But the difference here is that it's it deliberately lives inside the HTTPS protocol so that it becomes impossible to differentiate DNS over HTTPS from other things over HTTPS. In other words, it's the same port numbers, same protocols, and to the extent that those protocols are well enough encrypted, you won't know that a user or an endpoint is using some DNS server that is far from you and not under your policy control or monitoring. Uh, you, you can't tell, uh, there's, there's, and that's deliberate because that would be on path interference in DNS operations. I myself would have been embarrassed to write this paragraph because it is in quite deliberate, as far as I can tell, ignorance of the fact that not all offsite DNS is healthy and good. And uh, the people who pay to create and manage the network may not want this to occur and they should be asked. And we're working on that. There's an IETF working group called ADD used to be called Apps Doing DNS. Um, now it's something else, same acronym, different, uh, different words. Uh, but the idea is, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe it should be possible to learn whether your network wants you to do that DNS uh, over HTTPS or not. Um, and that's you know, a fig leaf of security, but it's an important fig leaf. Um, let's talk about QUIC. QUIC is a replacement for TCP itself. So TCP is the stream protocol that's been used for almost everything that wasn't DNS or NFS or NTP since the NCP transition uh, some decades ago. And it's a reliable stream protocol and you know, it makes sense that everything has wanted to use it. The problem is uh, that although you can encrypt what's inside of TCP, you can encrypt your payloads, the headers, of the TCP protocol are information rich. And so pervasive monitoring, such as what you might wish to do as a site security administration or administrator uh, is very easy with TCP. With QUIC, all of that goes away. There is nothing 
that is in Quick that can be used to manage it. And there is an internet draft, it's not yet an RFC, uh, that actually says, you know, the wire image, in other words, what it looks like uh, as a signal uh, is not specifically designed to be distinguishable. I think that's weak. I think it is specifically designed to be indistinguishable. And I've requested that edit in the inter uh, internet draft because I'm waiting for somebody to argue with me and say, oh, that's not what we intended because it is. And that's also what RFC uh, 7258 says to do. So it's, it shouldn't be controversial. Um, but this means that whatever you were doing that was looking at TCP headers, like using TCP dump or some other packet <clears throat> thing, all you're going to see is uh, high entropy junk. And um, Last but not least, we have encrypted client hello, right? TLS is what makes all of these secure protocols go. And uh, it has been revised a couple of times. TLS 1.2 is the current thing. Uh, I myself have turned off TLS 1.1 and 1.0 on several of my servers. It's amazing how much less spam you get because spammers don't seem to update their middleware very often. Um, but you know, other than spam, I'm not missing anything. So you should consider updating your TLS on all of your servers that can accept outside connections. Uh, it's already been done for you by your browser makers uh, for outbound connections, but you, you, you got to see what you're doing with inbound ones. In any case, um, one of the features of TLS 1.3, which is now kind of being prepared, uh, is called encrypted client hello. And that is where we take what used to be uh, clear text in the TLS protocol, which was the server name that you were trying to talk to, and we encrypt that as well. Uh, seems like a terrific oversight that it wasn't done originally. Um, you know, if you just look at the way it's it's abused, but it turns out it gets used by next generation firewalls. Uh, so if you've got something that's doing packet inspection and trying to decide whether this particular thing is malware or not, and sitting at the edge of your network and so forth, it expects to be able to look at the server name that a flow is trying to reach. And uh, in TLS 1.3 with ECH, that server name will no longer be uh, visible. So if you have a policy that says, yeah, you can't get to www.badplace.com, well, that website is probably on some shared host, right? All you're gonna know is what IP address the packet is going to, which could be millions of different uh, SNIs, server names. And there again, you see uh, entropy being raised to whatever is its uh, local maximum. So you have choices, all bad. Um, and, you know, I'll run through them quickly. Uh, if you can't afford the fight, you're just going to live in the world where the floodgates are open. Um, but that is, that's a terrific price to pay. And there are network operators uh, for whom that price is too high, by which I mean the price of trying to avoid paying that price uh, doesn't matter to them. Uh, government agencies would be an example. Uh, MSPs, uh, cloud operators, whatever, um, and whatever has to be done, if you're in the business of keeping other people's information secure, you're going to have to do whatever must be done. Um, so as a uh, secure private network operator, you may decide to enforce the use of a proxy at your edge and just say, look, if you're browsing the web and you want to reach the web, you're going to do that by setting a proxy and trusting my key, letting me sort of look at your data in clear text and decide whether it is good or bad according to the policies that we enforce. That is gonna be hard. You know, IoT, for example, has no good way to be told what the, that there is a proxy, um, but it's also just gonna be hard. Um, a lot of users don't want that level of transparency of their data. I'm just about out of time, but I'm also just about out of material. Um, and in, I've been given to understand that uh, in England and possibly the rest of the United Kingdom, if an employee of a company is doing online banking during their lunch hour using the company's provided laptop in a company office on a company network, then the company is not supposed to look at that. It's actually a matter of law, not custom. 
Um, I'm not sure how I would go about figuring out what that was other than having a list of banks and letting them all through. But now we won't know where you're going. So we can't even have the policy of letting some things through without modification or uh, observation. Another thing you can do, and this is what I've done for decades, is to block all transgateway UDP. Uh, if you want to speak the UDP protocol, it's because you want NTP, the time protocol, or DNS, the name protocol. I have those servers locally. If you want to use one that isn't local, you, you're going to fail. And then your owner is going to complain to me, and then we're going to work together to fix that up. Um, but that's the way to stop quick from raising the entropy of what is currently in TCP to a practically uh, perfect level. Um, but you're going to have trouble. There is pain from this. Um, you have to also deny list various uh, DOH locations. If you don't want somebody to, to reach a uh, DNS over HTTP server outside your network, well, you can't just block HTTPS, um, but you can block it to certain well-known DOH servers. Yes, I know that's fig leaf security. There will always be more DOH servers than you know about. It's an important fig leaf. You can also block TLS 1.3. That's what uh, Russia announced that they would do. Um, and I expect that authoritarian governments and corporations and some families are going to do the same because they need to see that, that server name indicator in order to know whether a given flow should be permitted or should be denied. And, um, you know, the, this is a high price to pay, but not doing anything is about to be a much higher price for many secure private network operators. And I think we should all expect a lot of innovation to occur here. It's gonna be a war of one-upmanship. Uh, we will come up with ways to sort of keep our network safe. And then the protocols will gradually uh, morph into something that uh, violates our assumptions and uh, works in spite of our best efforts. That's the war we're in. I'm, I feel like I'm on the wrong side of it, but I got to do what I got to do. I wish the people who were on the other side of this would recognize that there are such things as secure private networks and firewalls are not ancient technology. So um, let me say that in a 1967 episode of the original Star Trek series, the M5 computer uh, decided that it wanted to have its own connection and did not want anybody or anything in the way. And um, that's, this is what it looks like when endpoints have demands. This is what it looks like to us as operators of secure private networks. And uh, I hope you'll take this away and use it to sort of figure out uh, what's about to happen to you and your networks and what are you going to do about it? So thank you. I don't know if we have time for questions. Uh, thanks, Paul. Yes, we do have uh, time for questions. Please, folks, uh, send your questions or anybody in the panelists wants to ask a question, please go ahead. Drew, can we just go ahead and speak? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, I just want to thank Paul for a great talk. Uh, and I know we're about out of time. I'd love to have him back to explore, I guess, his next to the last slide in more detail. In other words, in the categories of what can we do about this? What are some of the alternatives and what are the pros and cons and details of them? And I don't expect you to address that now, but you outlined a couple of potential alternatives there that some of us are considering. And uh, I just don't know personally enough about them, and I'd like to explore it in more detail with somebody who does. So thanks again. Thank you. And, you know, uh, I love this kind of thing. I, I love to have an audience who is actually interested in these topics. So I'll be happy to come back. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Paul. Uh, we have one question. Uh, the question is from William. Even all the governments involved in cybersecurity, what do you expect their response to issues like uh, TLS 1.3? Well, if you're a government, 
uh, then you have sort of the power to mandate things. And, you know, often those mandates are impractical. I know that IPv6 has been mandated for a long time, as has DNSSEC, but they are not universally deployed among the government agencies uh, to whom those mandates apply. And that's because you can ask for an exemption. And so they do over and over again. But I expect that because of the incredible, extraordinary cost of doing nothing, uh, that any agency that is not currently enforcing a um, ALG, uh, application layer gateway proxy of some kind, uh, will be doing that. And uh, so that's the stroke of the pen approach. I think um, exemptions to that mandate are gonna be a little bit harder to come by because it is security related and everybody is worried about sort of what other nations might want to do to the power grid or, you know, whatever. Certainly the Office of Personnel Management attack is still uppermost in many government minds. Uh, so I think that's what they will do. Um, and, you know, that's practical if you can get away with it. Uh, it is the impracticality for the rest of us that concerns me. Thanks, Paul. So let's uh, move ahead to the next talk. Let me quickly share screen. And let me quickly uh, invite our last speaker of the day. That's Ron Monica, who's a distinguished engineer at Juniper Network. He's been working in IPv6 for a long time, as, as well as on segment routing. He is quite active in ITF. He currently chairs V6 Ops and the OpsSec Working Group. He was part of the ISG as a part of ITF Operation and Management Area. And off to you, Ron, to hear what are the problems that keep you up at night. Thanks, Ron. Okay, thank you very much. Should I share my screen or? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, we're gonna touch a few topics today. Uh, Ron, could you full, make it full screen if it's possible? Oh. Uh, let's see, how do I do that? I think leave it, it's pretty good. Uh, let's start. Okay. Um, I was asked um, to talk about problems that keep me awake at night, and I'll talk specifically from the perspective of somebody who lives in the world of IPv6 and somebody who was a standards maker. Um, and I'll also try to keep this a little lighthearted because we've We've been through some, uh, some intense topic. <laughs> so what exactly are the problems that keep me awake at night? Well, the actual causes of sleep for me are geriatric aches and pains, my own snoring, and the sounds of raccoons chattering as they chew up the garden in my backyard. Um, you'll see Rocky to the right here. Uh, what doesn't cause me to lose uh, sleep is the current state of the internet. The internet is a, a huge success. You know, for all of its problems, it's ubiquitous. It serves over 4 billion users. And it can, it can and will scale to be much, much larger. It's stable. We haven't had a global outage for over 25 years. There have been short-lived outages, you know, limited to a service or a carrier or a ge geographic region. <clears throat> and it supports everything. The global economy, telemedicine, emergency services, and even this conference. This is truly historic. Everybody should be very proud of what we've done. But every time something is a success, what makes it a success makes it a little bit troublesome. Um, now I'm starting to worry a little bit. If everything relies on the internet, the internet must stand up to the test of time. Hardware is going to come and go. But the internet protocol suite may still be connecting the world 100 years from now, maybe 200, maybe 300, Lord knows how long. 
Um, as an example, we take a look at this picture of the Roman aqueducts on the right. They were built over 2,000 years ago. They're still carrying water. Um, and as, things, as more things come to rely on the internet, transition away from internet technologies are gonna become more and more difficult. Um, if you think the transition from IPv4 to IPv6 was difficult, um, the transition to the next thing in 500 years may be even more difficult because so much will rely on the internet by then. So, if we're thinking about transitions and, trans, uh, uh, and the life of a technology, we have to come to terms with the fact that every technology has a life cycle. It's somebody's idea at the time of inception. It's developed for a while, and during the development phase, it might be a little bit rocky. It might have some nasty outages. It might even have some bad problems. It has a maturity phase, and it has an obsolescence phase. Um, And to, you know, to take a look at a obsolescence phase is, uh, well, I'll ask a quick question to the audience. Does anybody recognize what that picture on the right is a picture of? Just unmute and say if you know what it is. Yes, I have one. <laughs> yeah. And I suspect, suspect Paul has one too from the picture behind him. Uh, it's a Morse code key. In fact, this is the Morse code key that I used as a teenager. Um, a pretty good telegrapher um, can uh, tool along with this Morse code key at about uh, 16 bits per second. An internet interface can go at 800 billion bits per second today. So it shows why this poor code key is a bit obsolete, but it has some, you know, uh, romantic attachment, at least for Bob and I. Um, anyhow, the internet protocols are mostly mature now. They work, they carry the world's economy. Um, are they absolutely ready to set in, say they're set in stone, they will never change? Absolutely not. You know, we just heard Paul talk about um, the mishmash of new protocols and it they are growing for very good reasons. There are new problems that need to be solved. So even during the maturity phase of a technology, um, the, the protocol does not, does not ossify. It doesn't, it doesn't come to a point that it's not changing at all. It's mature so long as it can evolve to meet new requirements and new, new ecosystems without you know, crumbling into something that's so complex nobody can understand it. It becomes obsolete later when either it can't evolve anymore or it's so complex that um, nobody can understand it. We'll have a slide on that a little bit later. But here, the challenge is to maintain the internet protocol, so the maturity phase is very, very long. We've hit maturity, we want it to stay in maturity for a long time. And to do that, we have to kind of walk a tightrope. The tightrope is between allowing the protocols to evolve so they meet with new requirements and changing them in such a way that the initial architecture is broken, changing them in such a way that it becomes so complex nobody understands what they're doing, or changing them in such a way that we paint ourselves into a corner. So let's talk about what makes a protocol obsolete. Well, sometimes a protocol is obsolete because 
it's obsoleted by something that's just so much better. It's so much better that the cost of transition is justified. This is a good thing. So as much as I love my Morse code key, I'm going to have to say that transitioning away from Morse code to internet um, was a very good thing. Another reason that a protocol becomes obsolete is it never really achieved maturity. It was deployed too fast. Um, we ignored the problems with it. And um, there, was, there was really no way to evolve it. I won't point at any examples of that. Um, another is changing requirements. Uh, requirements changed beyond the protocol's ability to evolve. Um, let's take a look a bit at, oh, say, um, X25. Re you know, new applications were coming up. They required speed X25 couldn't do. Um, and the protocol would have to change in very big ways, you know, things like link layer uh, integrity checks would have to go away. It's a bad thing when a protocol has reached a point that it can't evolve to meet new requirements. The other thing is a changing ecosystem. Um, something changed, either hardware or regulations or economics and the assumptions around which the protocol was designed become false. Um, this also happened to some degree to X25. Um, during, during the days when X25 was common, uh, line error rates were also very common. Link layer uh, integrity checks and retransmissions were required. Well, over time, transmission got better. Uh, hardware got better, and X25 became a solution to a problem that didn't exist anymore. The real killer is complexity. Uh, in order to evolve, the protocol, you know, too much stuff gets added to the protocol. And by that point, nobody understands how the pieces interact with each other. You know, clearly, nobody understands all the pieces because it's protocols become so large, but the, not understanding the interaction between the pieces is the real killer. Um, so this is really the tension that we're creating between evolving a protocol and evolving it in a willy-nilly way so that it becomes unmaintainable and sooner or later just doesn't de uh, deliver the kind of stability or performance performance that everybody expects out of it. So let's talk about uh, a little bit about what makes a protocol obsolete. And we talked about changing requirements being one of them. Um, and here, we'll talk about a classic example for IP of changing requirements. In the early 1990s, the internet supported file transfer and email. Um, the World Wide Web was coming to be, but websites, for the most part, were static and text-oriented, and it didn't matter if it took them a, time, a while to load. So um, no applications were particularly sensitive to loss, delay, or jitter, you know, modulo TCP stalls. If performance was suffi sufficiently bad, TCP would just stop. Um, in the late 1990s, voice and video applications were uh, introduced. And then we saw uh, you know, a sensitivity to loss, delay, and jitter. And a lot of stuff started happening then. Um, differentiated services traffic engineering, fast reroute. These things were all needed if we were going to have these new applications. It's, it's no coincidence that the introduction of real-time applications you know, 
happened at the same time as all of this uh, new work in the IETF. The good thing about this work is that it was done in a very modular way. One, one new piece of work didn't have much to do with another piece of work, and you could put, put modules in, take modules out, and the evolution was fairly orderly. Now, we did have some winners and some losers in this period of time. Um, DiffServe was a big winner. Um, I don't think it's possible to buy a router that doesn't support DiffServe in some, some flavor or other. But there were some evolutionary uh, losers too, like integrated services. Um, RSVP in its early days wasn't for signaling MPLS at all. It was for signaling bandwidth across an IP only internet. And um, you'll be hard pressed to find a implementation of that. Another thing that changes, uh, another thing that will cause a protocol to change and maybe not make it is a change in the ecosystem around it. And here we have another uh, example, the IPv4 addressing architecture. In the 1980s, um, IPv4 address space was plentiful and we had something called classful addressing. Um, addresses were divided into class A, B, and C. The high order bits of an address told you what kind of address it is. If the high order bit was a zero, you were looking at an address that belonged to a class A network. A class A network um, had seven, seven bits that identified the network, and the next um, 24 identified a host on the network. Then there were class Bs and class Cs. So you were encoding the type of network in the high order bits of the address. Well, this was a really good idea until we realized we were running out of class Bs. Um, class B exhaustion was predicted by 1992. So they came up with this idea for classless uh, addressing. Bob talked about, I think Bob talked about that earlier this morning. The subnet mask wasn't included in the IPv4 address. In fact, there were no more class A, B, and C addresses. An address could be a slash eight, like a class A, or a slash nine, or a slash 10, or anything down to a slash 32. And the subnet mask, wouldn't be encoded in the address at all anymore. You'd have to learn that from the control plane. Um, well, the internet protocol evolved quite nicely. We now have classless addressing. Um, the change affected the forwarding plane a little bit. Fibs were a little different. And it affected the control plane. And that the control plane protocol, SIS, BGP, uh, had, well, I guess BGP didn't exist yet. Um, but control plane protocols had to carry the subnet mask. Another example of the changing e ecosystem was BGP sent, uh, session authentication. Um, in 1998, blind reset attacks against BGP were possible. Um, What's a blind reset attack? A blind reset attack is an attack in which a third party, you know, two parties have a long lived TCP connection. A third party sends a, pack, uh, a packet to one of them, impersonating one of, impersonating one of the participants, one of the legitimate participants. That packet has a reset bit set, and it also has. Um, a correct guest sequence number. When that happens, the party who receives the blind reset um, believes that the legitimate peer has reset the uh, session and he tears it down. Now, for
for some sessions, like for some applications of TCP, like BGP, this is a bad thing because BGP will reset the session, um, learn all the routes again, that may take minutes. And you know, the, because the BGP session is down for minutes, users are affected for that long. So um, back in 98, they had a protocol uh, extension to TCP called TCP MD5, where um, both parties shared a key and every segment had an option in it that had a Mac and the Mac was calculated over the entire packet and uh, or the entire TCP segment and um, the shared key. Well, this was fine except for a couple problems. It had a weak authentication protocol and key change required a BGP reset. And the BGP reset was exactly what you were trying to avoid. You know, because of that, and because people were afraid that it would make CPUs boil over, um, it wasn't widely deployed. Um, when it was re deployed, key replacement wasn't seen as a high priority. So keys were left the same for years and years and years. Well, by 2010, there was an increase of cyber attacks. Um, and the internet community reevaluated this. So TCP MD5 was replaced by TCP AO. Um, it had authentication key agility, so you could use the strongest key available um, at that time. And a key change didn't require a session reset. Um, the internet protocol suite evolved nicely. This was implemented by many router vendors, soon to be in Linux. And it's an example of things changing, the ecosystem changing around a protocol, the protocol adapting, and adapting in such a way that it doesn't really add much complexity to the entire protocol suite because one module was swapped out, one, another module swapped in, and the coincidental uh, impact on other modules was you know, slim to none. So the next thing that causes protocols to become obsolete is complexity, collapsing under its own weight. At the beginning of the slide deck, I said I slept perfectly well. Well, maybe not. Um, the internet protocol suite is modular. New modules can be added, they can be uh, obsoleted, they can uh, be deleted. And examples, we just talked about TCP5, uh, TCP MD5 and TCP AO. On a good day, the coupling between modules is well-defined and minimized so that the unintended consequences of changing mo one module um, are minimized. Uh, the unintended consequences of changing one module, the consequences of hurting one module by changing another are minimized. Um, so the internet hasn't collapsed under its own weight. And we hope it all stays that way. Um, there is a way that it may not. If we, if we touch the internet protocol suite when it doesn't need to be touched, or if we touch it in such a way that we're violating the initial architecture of the internet, we could get ourselves into serious trouble. And this is a place where standards makers have a responsibility. We're walking a bit of a tightrope. Um, we need to allow the protocol to evolve. Whoops. <laughs> to evolve with one O. Um, but we don't want to add so much stuff to make the protocols become unmaintainable. Um, good, en good engineering practices may save us from ourselves. So what are some of the 
uh, engineering practices uh, that, you know, I, I strongly recommend the IETF to abide by, and particularly because the IETF has had a small problem abiding by these recently. First is never change the syntax or semantics of a protocol field unless there's an earth-shaking motivation to do so. Um, you'd think that I wouldn't have to say this, but there have been an, enough proposals to borrow bits from the IPv6 flow label or borrow bits from the IPv6 destination address that probably it, it needs saying again. At best, um, doing things like this increase uh, complexity, uh, kind of like the game of Fizbin. The game of Fizbin is a card game that's so complex, nobody can play it. And if you care to see what Fizbin is, follow this link, uh, especially if you're a Trekkie, and you'll get a great laugh from it. At worst, changing the semantics of a protocol field can break backwards compatibility. Next is consider protocol state. Protocol state is the natural enemy of scalability. You know, routers have memory constraints. Granted, they have much more memory today than they had even five years ago, but it's difficult to manage you know, large, uh, uh, well, pro routers have memory constraints and it's difficult to manage large quantities of state in real time. Um, think about what it takes to get a download, uh, a full download, a, a download of full uh, internet routes. Um, think about how much time it might take to, uh, to reestablish uh, re traffic engineering state after a, an outage in the core of your network. Um, the less state you have, the quicker you can manage this stuff. But sometimes protocol state is just a necessary evil. Um, affording information base is protocol state. You know, try building a router without affording, affording information base. It just can't be done. So choose wisely among no state, soft state, and hard state. The next bit of advice is layering is your friend. Decide which services a layer offers, and unless there's an earth-shaking motivation to do so, stick with the original plan. Um, avoid the temptation to make layer n subsume layer n plus one or layer n minus one. In most cases, um, making one layer do the job of another only moves the complexity from one place to another. In most cases, this is only an attempt to align the internet architecture with something else, either a hardware architecture or an organizational structure. Um, but that's really not a good idea. Uh, the internet architecture, you want to be persistent. While hardware arch uh, architectures and organizational structures just come and go. The next is only solve significant problems. Um, you know, the problems that cause pain today, the problems that are likely to cause pain tomorrow, the ones with sufficient uh, return in, on investment. You know, is implementing and uh, deploying the solution really more painful than the problem? And also avoid the temptation of shiny objects. Um, solutions to problems that will never cause pain. Um, th there's a real temptation to come up with a, a new piece of protocol machinery. L look at how efficient and how, you know, how clever it is. But the problem itself either isn't causing pain, probably won't cause pain, or won't cause much pain. Um, in this case, do we really want to pursue the shiny object or 
we just want to realize we've invented it and you know, move on from there. And finally, don't be afraid to deprecate things. The RFC series has over 9,200 documents in them uh, in it today. Some of those represent currently deployed technologies. Others represent eh, some good ideas whose time hasn't come yet, some obsolete technologies that are no longer deployed, completed experiments, and bad ideas whose time will never come. Well, with a RFC series of 9,200 documents, nobody can really tell what, you know, what's widely deployed, you know, what, what isn't widely deployed and why. Um, and the more technologies we have, the more interactions we have between them. The interactions aren't well understood. Uh, and there are more in, uh, unintended consequences associated with changing anything. In short, we could paint ourselves into a corner. So that de uh, deprecating things might not really be as bad an idea as we think it is. Um, if we deprecate something that we need, realize we need again, we can always bring it back. But having, my guess right now is 25% of the RFC series is about stuff that is long ago come has come and gone long ago so don't be afraid to deprecate and finally some advice to ietf attendees first and foremost observe the changing internet ecosystem new applications uh, more capable hardware centralization of applications and data sets, centers, new security threats. What is new in the internet? Um, what is causing us to change? What are the stressors that are forcing us to evolve? Then, evolve the internet, um, uh, evolve the internet protocol, adapt. Additions, changes, deletions are all required. But observe those best engineering practices. Don't, don't break the basic architecture to make a short-term gain. In short, don't eat the goose that lays the golden eggs. And with that, I'll pause for questions. Thank you, Ron. Very interesting presentation. A lot of good advice, a lot of good history. Uh, any question, folks? Uh, panelists, feel free to ask questions as well. Not seeing any question. Uh, Ron, one question uh, which I would have is that uh, like you give a suggestion for deprecating stuff, uh, but we see that that's not really happening. And what do you think is the reason that we, we are not able to do that? And like, you know, as an ITF attendees, what, what can we do as a participant to make sure that uh, we actually follow your advice there? Well, <clears throat> this is a little bit like um, cleaning your house. Your house looks cluttered the first day uh, you start to clean it. You clean out one little piece, one little thing, and you realize you have a little bit of space and you start reorganizing. And then you realize you have a little more space and you reorganize a little more. And sooner or later, you have a nice clean house. Well, we could do the same thing with the RFC series, but we have the problem of the same problem the guy cleaning his house has. You try to deprecate something that clearly nobody is using anymore. But somebody jumps up and says, well, wait a minute, this is used by this other RFC. Well, guess what? This other RFC probably needs to be deprecated also. But 
because there's this interaction between this one thing that nobody's using and something else that nobody's using, you never get to deprecate that first thing. Um, what we really need to do is first go through, find some of the low hanging fruit. Um, you know, I'm thinking right now of a, a draft I have to deprecate the router alert option um, in IPv6. Um, it, it's pretty clear that it's not being used widely, but it's not a trivial object. Uh, it's not a trivial task to deprecate it because there are so many, you know, there are, there are other protocols like GIST that also aren't being used that rely on it. <coughs> so we've, we've already started to paint ourselves into the corner and we need to be a little aggressive to get ourselves out of that corner. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Ron, there's one question from Alper. Uh, he asked, what do you think about the named data networking or another new technologies that claim to replace the internet? I'm sorry, could you repeat? Uh, the, what do I think about what? The named data networking. I think it's a research initiative uh, called named data networking. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I know that. Um, it, it's an interesting, um, interesting uh, bit of research. I think it will take, you know, some years to figure out why that is required beyond what we have today. Um, once there, once there's a clear driver, I think it, you know. I think it may take off, but it depends on that driver. Thank you, Ron. I don't see any more questions. Oh, there's one more. What's your take on RENA as a clean slate architecture? So I think a lot of research questions coming in your way. I have to confess, I'm not familiar with it at all. Uh, yeah, uh, Yakan, could you, could you expand a little bit? Maybe tell a few things. I can also let you speak if you like. A recursive Internet Architecture by John Day. I'm sorry, not familiar with it at all. Uh, uh, yeah, do reach out to us after the connections and maybe we'll try and find a good speaker who can talk about something in a future <clears throat> event. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. Uh, Ron, would you mind uh, like uh, unsharing your screen so that I can share? Oh, certainly. Close the session. Hey, Drew. Yes, Mike, go ahead. Is it, is it possible to ask a question of, of all panelists or is it past time for something like that? We are two minutes over, but that's okay. Let's go ahead, last question. Okay, my, my first comment is a great set of speakers and content today. This has just been, been fantastic. And, and I wanna give a special shout out to Bob with his walk down IP memory lane from somebody that lived and participated into it was really, really cool. Uh, so, so thanks to, to, to everybody for that. Uh, my, my question has to do with Nat, if anybody wants to hit on Nat. And, and in particular, from an enterprise point of view, we use way too much of it probably, and more and more coming. What should we watch for to know when we're using too much or what are sort of the manifestations of problems that we should see and be aware of as we approach issues? I can so take one issue that. that can hit you with Nat, <clears throat> I mean, uh, all of any, any issue is going to be of the form uh, becoming dependent upon. Um, and so a uh, fair number of networks use NAT as a security tool uh, because unless they've got port forwarding, uh, internal destinations are unavailable to external uh, sources. And that turns out to be a pleasant policy for many. On the other hand, if at some point you uh, get IPv6 and you have native stuff and you don't have NAT anymore, you're going to have to find a different way to do what you used to get as a side effect of NAT. And so I would say uh, look for that. Good answer. Good info. Thanks. 
Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Kathy, off to you. Just want to thank everybody for such a great um, conference today, the speakers, and um, make sure to stay in touch with us. You can join um, INTC or IIESOC or both. Um, and thanks so much to our sponsors for your generous contributions to our cause here. It's been great. We'll see you all tomorrow for another exciting group of speakers for IP, the IPv6 track. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.